I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The whole matter of you living your Christian life is a work of the Holy Spirit. All the ministry of spiritual gifts, everything I do, everything I do, everything you do, everything anybody does in the kingdom, in the body of Christ that has any effect or any impact or any purpose or any goal or any success is the work of the Holy Spirit. How can we ignore that and replace that with such crazy things? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. One of the most famous prophecies that Jesus makes is about the coming of someone he refers to as the Son of Man. Now many people believe that he's talking about a second coming of himself. And many people believe that this is going to occur some point in the future. Jesus makes very specific prophecies as to what will happen when the Son of Man makes his visitation. John 16, 7 to 15, nonetheless, I will tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. For if I go, I will send him to you. And they wondered that there has come to them a warner from among themselves. And the disbelievers say, this is a magician and a liar. Man, 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 not a ghost, not a spook. But we are told it's a spirit. That's what your Bible says. You see, every time the word spirit is used in your Bible, I'm telling the Christian, it doesn't stand for the Holy Ghost. Because in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it, we are told that seven spirits of God went out into the world. I say, you believe in seven Holy Ghosts? He says, no, there's only one Holy Ghost. I said, look, it's a seven spirits. I mean, it should be seven Holy Ghosts. No, spirit doesn't stand for Holy Ghost every time. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have disbelieved, or yet they have hated both me and my father. Not disbelieve, hate. So this is also the more natural understanding of the verse. And when he comes, you will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin because they don't believe in me. The phrasing here would be a bit awkward, but if you understand this as specifying the sin as being unbelief, that makes more sense. And when he comes, he will convict the sin 
or he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin in that they don't believe in me. That This applies to Christians who claim to be believers in Jesus, then the paraclete will come and he will expose them, he will uncover them, and he will bring, uh, he will bring to light that they're actually disbelievers in Jesus. But when it comes to Christians, they claim to believe in Jesus, so the paraclete comes and he proves with sound evidence that they are in fact disbelievers in Jesus. So all this, proving they're disbelievers in Jesus, exposing them to be disbelievers in Jesus, that better fits a party who claim to believe in Jesus, but the paraclete will show slash expose them to be unbelievers. Remember, the paraclete convicts the whole world, right? So that shows that the conviction here is of a party, group of people, many people all together, collectively. Uh, and also the paraclete's revelation would then have an objective frame of reference by which they are being convicted. The Christians, they disbelieve in what Jesus affirmed about himself. That is why they are, in fact, disbelievers. The Holy Spirit, does it bring evidence? No, it just tickles some people. Does it expose the Christian world of being disbelievers in Jesus? No. Allah will bring forth a beast from the earth, which will speak to people and tell them that they didn't firmly believe in Allah's signs. There's not much known about this beast, but Muslims have speculated that this will be a big and scary beast that goes around putting marks on people's faces that will distinguish the believer from the disbeliever or the hypocrite. John 16, 12 to 15, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you all things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit comes, and we know that the Holy Spirit then lives among us. The Holy Spirit guides people into all truth, right? All truth, guiding all people, or at least having the ability to guide all people. I don't believe it. Well, look at right here, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination. Now, we all know that that woman is demon-possessed. Now, that woman is satanic. Which brought her masters much gain by Sue's saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What? What? Why would Satan proclaim the gospel, the right gospel? Why would Satan proclaim the gospel, the right gospel? Jesus says that he and the Father share in glory, right? So the Holy Spirit also shares in this glory. The one who judges. As we discussed in the previous episode, according to Isaiah 11 chapter 3 and 4 verses, the root of David, the Christ of second coming, is coming to judge. In Luke 4 chapter 18th verse, Jesus went into the synagogue and took the scroll of Isaiah and read out Isaiah 61st chapter 1-2 verses, that he was sent to proclaim the year of Lord's favor and ended it. Surprisingly, Jesus left some part of the same verse, the day of vengeance, unread. This incident has a hidden meaning. Pay attention. 
Jesus did not come into this world to take vengeance or to judge. Jesus he himself told it in John 8 chapter 15th verse. I pass judgment on none. As for the person who hears my words but doesn't accept them, I do not judge them. Then who has to judge? In John 12 chapter 48th verse, it is written that there is a judge for who rejects me and doesn't accept my words. John 8th chapter 50th verse says, I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. In John 12, chapter 48, verse, Jesus says, His words will condemn him at the last days. In Acts 17, chapter 31st verse, The man he has appointed to judge on the day he had said, is the man in Revelation 12, chapter 4th verse, the male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scripture. The woman giving birth to a child in John 16 chapter 21st verse is the Christ of second coming. In John 16 chapter 7th verse Jesus says, I will send him to you when he comes he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. That is why Jesus told in John 16 chapter 16th verse, In a little while you will see me no more and thereafter a little while you will see me. Paul writes letters to Christian churches that he himself founded, and in virtually every letter, he writes his, letter to the Corinthians, his letters to the Corinthians in order to argue that people don't already have spiritual salvation, that full salvation won't come until the second coming of Jesus. Full salvation won't come until the second coming of Jesus. Full salvation won't come until the second coming of Jesus. Full salvation won't come until the second coming of Jesus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to lift this ummah from its absolute misery and feeble state that it is now. It's going to lift it back up to its victorious, honorable state, back to its nobleness that it once carried, this ummah. From once being united to our disunity today, it will return back to the unity. It's going to return back to its glory. It will become the leading nation of the world in every sense of the word as it once was before and even better. Islam, when we say here Islam, it began very strange to the people. Strange. I don't know of this, much of this new ways before. And it will come back in the future strange again. The way it started in the beginning. Just exactly the same way. Then he said, Good news to those who are strange. What's strange? Strange is different to weird. Strange doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that it's unknown to the people's customs and traditions and knowledge that they've always had. It's strange, but interesting. I wonder if I was wrong all this time, and this strange religion is the right one. It's just strange, meaning unknown. For Islam began like that, and the Muslims have divided, and they are strangers to one another. So what is this new religion you're bringing us, they said. We're bringing a new religion to them now. We've never heard of it all our lives. Our ancestors have always practiced this, and now this is strange. Khilafah will return back leadership of the Muslims to the way the Prophet ﷺ began it. And that is yet to happen. That is yet to happen. So this is another sign that is inevitably coming. But the thing is, the Muslims will return. The nation of, of Islam in its proper teachings, its proper form, as it began, will come back and will fill the world with peace and justice, just as it was filled with injustice and tyranny. And that's the time of Al-Mahdi. When the fullness of time had come, in other words, at the exact moment when it was right, when it was time, in the fullness of time. Because God is never early and he can't be late. In the fullness of time. When everything was exactly right, when everything was exactly as God intended it to be, in the exact moment that God intended it to happen, God was not reacting to situations or circumstances. It was in the fullness of time. God did not decide that things had gotten so out of hand that something had to be done. This was in the fullness of time. God did exactly what he intended, exactly when he intended, exactly how he intended. If Christ came to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, then that means that we were not sons or we are not sons prior to that adoption. And not only are we not sons, but we're enemies.
rightly deserving the wrath of God. And that may sound ugly, and it is. In fact, it's uglier than it sounds. But it's only when you understand the ugliness of that that you understand the beauty of our adoption in Christ. In their system, this man, this prophet Jesus, who is now in heaven, never having died, plays a key role in the end times because He will return from heaven without dying. He will come back when Allah sends Him back. Now the question to ask is why would Allah want to send Jesus back? He has a lot of prophets to pick from. Why does He send Jesus back? Answer so that when He shows up, He can correct all the Christians who have misunderstood who He is. So in the second coming, the Holy Ghost should come as a son of woman to judge and rule. Before judgment, indictment should occur. In the days of Noah, people did not listen to the caution of God and got destroyed by floods. In Lord's days, the Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed to their grievous sins. According to Luke 19, chapter 43rd and 44th verses, Jews did not recognize the time of God's coming. Jews did not recognize the time of God's coming. Jews did not recognize the time of God's coming. Soon as written in 43rd verse in 75th AD, Jerusalem was embanked and encircled by Titus and was destroyed. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus makes a distinction between speaking a word against the Son of Man and speaking against the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, the paraclete is uh, convicting the world regarding this. And just a recap of a previous video, we discussed that the word for convict, as Raymond Brown points out, um, it is a question of bringing the merciless light of truth to bear on guilt. The word convict there means to like expose with a fiery nature, says he will demonstrate these matters so clearly as to leave no doubt on the minds of those who are simple of heart, and so fully as to confound and shut the mouth of those who are gainsayers. The paraclete is supposed to expose the world regarding their false stance on the righteousness of Christ, which they fell into error of due to Christ ascending. According to Matthew 13, chapter 37th verse, the one who sowed the good seed is son of man. According to Revelation 14, chapter 14th verse, Christ, like a son of man, came with a sharp sickle in harvest period. In the same way, in Daniel 7, chapter 13th verse, we will see the one like a son of man. We need to carefully observe the verse, it is like a son of man, not son of man. We can only recognize the Christ in the second coming. We can only find the same featured seeds in the harvest. It is our foolishness to expect same seed in the harvest. That means it is foolish if you want to see same Christ whom we see in pictures with long beard and hair, wearing long shirt, having wounds on his palm. This is hard teaching but it is according to Bible. Not with the outer form of Christ but by comparing with deeds, teaching, and with the lifestyle of Christ, we should recognize the Christ in second coming. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. But another was made to resemble him to them. But another was made to resemble him to them.
They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. The false image of the Messiah, Christ, the most common images seen in many homes and churches, is the image of Caesar Borgia, son of Pope Alexander VI, who employed Leonardo da Vinci, his son Caesar's gay lover, to paint Caesar as the Christ. Last time you saw me, I actually came clean and told you that I wasn't the real Jesus. I also told you that I was created to make certain populations happy and comfortable. Well, I am glad to see that many of you are loyal and enjoy strong delusions and still want me as your savior. <laughs> wow! What idiots! But another was made to resemble him to them. They have no knowledge of it, except the following of assumption. Wow! What idiots! For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. who belong to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Reprobate according to Jeremiah 6 verse 30 simply means rejected. And in context of a person, it's referring to an individual who has been rejected by God and therefore beyond the hope of salvation. That means there are people in this world that can no longer be saved. The Bible would describe them on a spectrum that ranges from sodomites all the way to false prophets. And despite what the Calvinists teach, reprobates are not born, they're made. According to the Bible, we all start off as unsaved people until the gospel is given unto us. Some believe, some don't. But then there's a subcategory of people who not only reject the gospel, but actually become vehemently adversarial towards God. They begin to hate him and don't want to retain him in their knowledge. God will then assist them in their quest to reject him and remove their ability to believe along with their moral compass. The Bible says that they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These are people who have crossed the event horizon of the hope of salvation and are eternally damned. That is the recompense of the enemies of Allah, the fire. For them therein is the home of eternity, as recompense for what they, of our verses, were rejecting. Let's go to the book of Isaiah in the New International Version of the Bible, and you will find the word destiny there. Look what it says in verse number 11. Uh, but as you that forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain and spread a table for furniture and fill bowls of mixed wine for destiny, notice what it says here, I will destine you for the sword and you will all fall in the slaughter. For I called you and you did not answer. I spoke, you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Jesus just showed and displayed publicly. His, his power over evil. He has authority over demons and the crowd correctly interpreted his actions. Verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Now this is the Pharisees who had seen Jesus perform in this way 
numerous times were not very pleased with that reaction. They decide that there's no way that he's doing this in God's power, but through Satan's power. They were basically accusing him of sorcery. Verse 25, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Christians and Jews and polytheists who see the message and disbelief and reject the commands of the Quran will go to hell and are the worst of creation. <laughs> I love this verse. As everybody already knows, I am certainly going to hell for all the beautiful things that I do for the religion of Islam. Did I not enjoin upon you, O children of Adam, that you not worship Satan, for indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. So Jesus basically makes the point that it makes no sense for Satan to be against himself. His point was very simple. What would Satan's motive be to be doing this? Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So this better fits Christians who openly claim to believe in Jesus, and then the paraclete comes and he uncovers, he brings to light that actually they don't believe in him. They, their disbelief is a hidden sin that is then exposed. And also, remember, he's supposed to prove that they're disbelievers in Jesus. Do you have to prove that Jews and pagans disbelieve in Jesus? Why do you have to prove it? They openly say it. But Christians, now they claim to believe in Jesus, so it makes sense that you would prove that actually they don't believe in him and expose them as being disbelievers. So by that criteria, we can determine that the paraclete is supposed to expose and prove that uh, Christians, those who claim to believe in Jesus, actually don't. And remember, according to Clark, it's supposed to confuse them. Now, Christians who claim to believe in Jesus, it would confuse them when they would be convicted of disbelief, but not so much Jews who hear it all the time, you disbelieve in Jesus, right? No, rather the world generally, uh, collectively, is being exposed. That party is collectively being accused. To explain this further, it's knowing the truth beyond a shadow of a doubt, seeing and experiencing the works of the Spirit as demonstrated by Jesus, but outright denying it because of your hardened heart. That's blaspheming the Spirit. Jesus gave these people more light and truth than at any point ever yet he was still denied it's a complete willful total hardening of your heart we haven't really looked down hard at the ministry of the holy spirit to see what we need to be focused on judges 3 10 he's called the spirit of the lord god in isaiah 61 the spirit of your father in matthew 10 20 and the spirit of the living god in second corinthians 3 3. he is given all the titles he's called the spirit of jesus in acts 16 7 the Spirit of Christ right here in Romans 8 verse 9, Philippians 1 19, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And again, I say, look, I'm not here to defend the Holy Spirit. He can defend Himself. But I am here to tell you that you do not want to be sucked up into this mockery of the blessed Holy Spirit. You can sin against the Holy Spirit. And the worst of all sins are the sins against the Holy Spirit. You can anger the Spirit. As I pick up the Bible, I do discover the wrath of the Spirit. The translation from the Septuagint, as we read in, the, in, in Psalm, how often they rebelled and grieved Him in the desert. The translation is, they disobeyed and made angry the Spirit of God. They rebelled and angered His Holy Spirit. Therefore, He turned to be their enemy and Himself fought against them. Wouldn't it be terrible to have the Holy Spirit as your enemy? because you'd angered him. The word grieve means to make very angry. And I would urge every one of you to be very careful lest you rouse the wrath of the Spirit. Here's some verses that most pastors will probably never preach from. Psalm 5.5 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Psalm 139 verse 21 do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. 
Hosea chapter 9 verse 15, All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings will I drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Psalm 69 verse 28, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Now in spite of how controversial these verses might seem to pastors, God's commanded us to preach the entire counsel of God and not to be ashamed of His word. But in His second coming, He will born as a male child of woman and clears the work He has left. It is harsh to listen and accept, but it is the word of living God. Jesus was called as demon-possessed when He told the same words about Him in John 8, chapter 52nd verse. We should not refer to the Holy Spirit as an it because he is just as much of a person because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can speak to us and it also refers to the Holy Spirit as one who can be grieved, right? So the Holy Spirit is not just some force, he's not an it, he is actually a person. So him accusing them of blaspheming the spirit means they were not ignorant. They knew who he was. You cannot accidentally commit this sin. It is a willful blindness. Now to kind of back up a second, to kind of define what blasphemy is, it's, it's basically a religious crime in the highest sense. It's the highest form of disrespect and insult to the Almighty. So to blaspheme the spirit means to basically show such an outright, extreme, purposeful disrespect for God. And it's done to the point where you can never be forgiven of it. And when they see you, they take you not except in ridicule, saying, Is this the one whom Allah has sent as a messenger? By spirit they mean the paraclete. It's also interesting that Clark's commentary uh, explains the word and it says that he will demonstrate these matters so clearly as to leave no doubt in the minds of those who are simple of heart and so fully as to confound and shut the mouths of those who are gainsayers. Confound is interesting because it means like to confuse. So there's a party here that's being accused of the sin of unbelief in Jesus and according to Clark they're going to be confused. Now, the conviction includes an exposure of unbelief and God's negative judgment against it. In this usage, the verb carries the connotation of condemning what is exposed. This is not a dispassionate expose of unbelief, but rather a passionate demonstration of the guilt of sin in the sinful world, together with God's negative judgment against it. So what is apparently doing? He's exposing them of unbelief in Jesus. This is all attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit, who is revealing all these things. Now you know where this all comes from. This is again attributing to the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. But this is just one illustration of the aberrations that continue to be placed on the back of the Holy Spirit as if these are things that He is doing. It is such a frightening, frightening form of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? You who have forsaken me, declares the Lord, you keep going backward. So I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am tired of relenting. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work, and I have created the destroyer to ruin. For the destroyer is coming against her against Babylon, and her mighty men will be captured, their bows are shattered, for the Lord is a God of recompense, He will fully repay. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. All who see me mock me, they sneer and shake their heads. Do not let your speech cause you to sin and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Sounds of terror are in his ears, while at peace the destroyer comes upon him. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, 
and my soul shall abhor you. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, the Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen, let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen, let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Rudolf Baltman's commentary says the function of the paraclete is, uh, he continues, he will, the paraclete will uncover the world's guilt, uncover the world's guilt. The image that comes before the eyes is that of a lawsuit of cosmic dimensions taking place before the court of God. The world is accused and the paraclete is the prosecutor. This commentary says, explaining the word, that the focus in classical Greek is on putting to shame, treating with contempt, cross-examining, accusing, bringing to the test, proving, refuting. Isaiah 65, 10. But they were the ones who rebelled, and they grieved his Holy Spirit. So he, right, the Holy Spirit became an enemy to them, became an enemy to them. Non-persons can't become an enemy to you. The Spirit does not merely accuse men of sin. He brings to them an inescapable sense of guilt so that they realize their shame and helplessness before God, this conviction applies to three particular areas, sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit is the prosecuting attorney who presents God's case against humanity. He creates an inescapable awareness of sin so that it cannot be dismissed with an excuse or evaded by taking refuge in the fact that everyone is doing it. The paraclete would expose Christians as being disbelievers in Jesus. How do you know a false prophet? He's got a false spirit. True prophet? He's got a true spirit. But how are we to know? Is it the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ is of God? The spirit that confesseth that look, he said that Jesus is the true Messiah, Christ, the Messiah, is of God. You remember reading that? Mm. Right. So I said, now look, this is your book is giving you a test to apply. I'm telling you, look, this is what he said. To find out the truth from the false, this test is that if this prophet comes to you and he says he's a prophet of God, ask him, is Jesus the Christ? He says, no, then you are told to reject him. Fair? Yeah. That's what it says there, that look, the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ of God, means this is a true prophet. It says, behold, the angel said, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus. You read it, sir? It says in Arabic, Masihu, the same as Messiah. Masihu is ibn Maryama. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. So Muhammad is testifying that Jesus is the Christ. Muhammad testifies that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the true messenger of God, and he was born miraculously, which many modern day Christians don't believe today. This is 1,400 year old book that you are reading now. 1400 years ago, this is what Muhammad says about Jesus. That Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God, but he's not God and he's not physically not his son. And they said he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon him. That's why he said, if you deny the works that I do as being of God, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit working through me. He speaks the words of God because he has the Spirit working through him. The miracles Christ did and the message that He preached was the ministry of the Spirit through Him. What does He do in the world? What does the Holy Spirit do in the world? Well, He convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Genesis 6, 3, He strives with sinners, so He's the convicting power. According to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, He calls sinners. That's an effectual call. He actually calls them. Furthermore, He regenerates, John 3, you must be born of the Spirit. So in the world, He convicts, He calls, He gives regenerating life. He also witnesses to the truth of Christ. So it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that comes to the sinner, convicts the sinner, calls the sinner when the sinner understands the glories of Christ, and then He regenerates the sinner. Ephesians 5.18 says, be being kept filled with the Spirit. He fills us, which is a power statement, like the, the wind filling the sails and moving the ship. That's that analogy. He gives us gifts of the Spirit, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. 
several gifts divided equally among His people. He teaches us. He leads us into all truth, guides us into the understanding of Scripture, anointing that we have from God so that we know all things. Galatians 5.17, He makes war against our flesh and against sin on our behalf. John 14.16, He comforts us. Romans 8.14, I mentioned it earlier, He leads and guides us. Galatians 3, He sanctifies us. Acts 1.8, He empowers us for witness and evangelism. Their holy writings say this, the Mahdi will come riding on a white horse, and it even says in their writings, as it says in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. When the Mahdi arrives, he will discover hidden scriptures. He will discover them, interestingly enough, somewhere near the Sea of Galilee, and there will be there hidden scriptures, hidden gospels, and a hidden Torah. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And they will be the true scriptures which will be used by the Mahdi that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. To show the Jews and the Christians they were wrong that their scriptures were the false scriptures. What kind of understanding of Jesus is this? Well, it sounds very much like an understanding that we've seen in uh, non-Orthodox circles, in Gnostic and Docetic understandings of Jesus, where he doesn't have a real body. This becomes particularly clear when John is describing what happens at the crucifixion, where, in fact, Jesus is talking to, uh, to John, and he says, As for seeing me as I am in reality, I've told you this is impossible unless you are able to see me as my see me as my kinsman. You hear that I suffered, yet I suffered not. That I suffered not, yet I did suffer. You heard that I was pierced, yet was I not wounded, hanged, and was I not hanged? In other words, I was uh, you saw me hanged, but yet I wasn't hanged. The blood flowed from me. Yet it did not flow. And in a word, those things that you say of me I did not endure, and the things that, though, that do not, uh, they do not say, those I suffered. This is one of these complete paradoxes, that Jesus suffers, yet he doesn't really suffer. He feels pain, but he doesn't really feel pain. He looks to be mortal, he looks to be human, but in fact he's not really human. The eyes of Enoch, a righteous man, were opened by the Lord, And he saw a vision of the Lord and his angels in heaven, and he heard and saw, and understood everything from them. But what he saw was not for his generation, it was for one which was to come. And he spoke as he saw, that the Great One shall come out of his dwelling place, and shall tread upon the earth, and on Mount Sinai, appearing in all his strength and glory, and all who behold him shall be afraid. The watchers shall shake, and the earth shall tremble to its ends. The mountains shall fall, and the hills shall melt like wax in the flame. The earth shall be torn apart, and all which is on it shall be destroyed, and judgment shall come upon all. But with the righteous, he shall make peace. They shall prosper, and he shall protect and bless them. Behold, he shall come with ten thousand of his saints, to execute judgment upon the earth, and to destroy the wicked. He shall convict all flesh of their ungodly ways, and of the things they have spoken against him. And turning to the godless, Enoch spoke, saying, You, who are hard-hearted, you have not held to the commands of the Lord, but you have turned away from him, and spoken against him. And so, you shall find no peace. Cursed shall be your days and your names, and you shall perish and be destroyed without mercy. For all of you who are godless, there shall be a curse. The elect shall rejoice, 
and there shall be forgiveness and peace and salvation for them. But for all of you sinners, there shall be no salvation, only curses. The elect shall inherit the earth, and wisdom shall be given to them, that they may never sin again, either through forgetfulness or pride, for they shall be humbled. They shall never again transgress nor sin all the days of their lives, nor shall they die of the anger and wrath of the Lord. Their days shall be long and joyous and peaceful. And it was because of that that they had committed this sin. It was not a one-time act. It was persistent and deliberate rejection of Jesus and his work and his ministry. In other words, no further proof could have been given to the Pharisees to show that Jesus was who he said he was. They had reached their threshold for light and truth, yet they still denied it. Now, this is very different than being blinded. That implies some sort of innocent ignorance. This is different. You are not ignorant. You know that it's true. The Pharisees had irrefutable proof. This is knowing yet intentionally choosing to reject time and time again. And as I said before, the standard of light and truth that was given to them was unlike anything we've ever seen. So the standard for them was incredibly high. It was a very unique standard because of that reason. And it was because of that that they had committed this sin. If you look at verse 8 and verse 10, you'll see that the world is convicted with you, you meaning the Christians to come. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About righteousness, because I go to the Father where you can see me no longer. So the world is convicted with you, which further supports that it's the Christians who are being convicted. And of course, the prophet, he is a mercy to the people, but the Quran and the prophet was harsh when uh, uh, refuting shirk many times. Uh, and so John 16 is speaking about when they're convicted of disbelief in Jesus, then there'll be this harsh language. And uh, Allah, when he convicts the Christians and when the prophet spoke to Christians, uh, many times you see this harsh language. So to summarize, the paraclete, he's supposed to declare a party as being guilty of disbelief in Jesus. Check. There's supposed to be the stern, harsh, fiery tone uh, when convicting them of disbelief in Jesus. Check. There's supposed to be strong evidence to prove them wrong. Check. Not just the Holy Spirit tickles me. There's supposed to be uh, uh, people who are exposed, uncovered, brought to light as being disbelievers in Jesus, not people who admit we uh, don't believe in Jesus uh, openly. Rather, you go to people, you expose people of being disbelievers. He's supposed to address many, many people concerning their beliefs of Jesus, and there's supposed to be this tone of a legal advocate. And, and people who do willfully and completely reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit, of course, that's going to end in unforgiveness. When you think about the works of the Holy Spirit, in the Old Testament you see Him um, convicting people. Remember in Genesis 6, my spirit will not always strive with man. He's striving to bring conviction in the same way that I read from John 16, 8, uh, when the Spirit comes, He'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He is seen as the one who convicts men of sin. He is seen as the one who enables men to serve. Read Exodus 31, Judges 3, Judges 6, and the Spirit of God comes to enable people to serve. He's telling you that if I go, don't go, He won't come. But if I go, I will send Him. So that means the Holy Spirit was not there with Him. This comforter was not there with Him. If it is the Holy Spirit, then it doesn't make sense because in the book of Luke, first chapter, verse 41, it tells us that Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit before Jesus was born. Did she? Luke, if you want me to get the Bible, open it and read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 41 says, And Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. Then it says, And John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Then before Jesus parted, he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive means, like I'm saying, Receive this Holy Book. He said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did they or didn't they? They received it on his resurrection. No, he said, receive, I'm telling you, receive now, not when you die and when you're resurrected, you'll get this book. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did Elizabeth have the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost came upon her. Right, so she had it. What? Did John the Baptist have the Holy Ghost? You have them. He, then, then he says, if I don't go, he won't come. But he's there already with everybody. Everybody seems to have got the Holy Ghost, and you say, no, he say, he, he's going to say, afterwards, what do you mean afterwards? Elizabeth had it, John the Baptist had it, the disciples of Jesus had it, and Jesus said, you see. You see, they have uh, verses in the Bible, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, 
where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus says. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. And when he is come, he will convict the world in respect of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me and on and on. He says, if I don't go, the Comforter will not come unto you. The same chapter, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them. Now, nah, you haven't got that capacity. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Spirit of truth. Who is the spirit of truth? Ask the Christian. Is the Holy Ghost. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. So who is the spirit of truth? They said the Holy Ghost. I said, all right, if this is the Holy Ghost, tell us now, what new things has he given you in the past 2,000 years? What new things has he given you in the past 2,000 years? Then he said, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you to all truth. All your problems is going to solve. So 2,000 years have gone and I'm asking all the people who claim to have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, every church says it, Jehovah's Witnesses say they got it, Seventh-day Adventists they say got it, and the Lutherans, the Roman Catholics, the Dutch Reformed churches, everybody say he's got the Holy Ghost. Unless they're all lying. They all say they got it, so I'm asking them, this Holy Ghost in 2,000 years, what did he tell you about problem of racism? I want only one, he said, I have yet many, many in English means more than one. And he'll guide you into all truth, all means more than one, I take it. I just want one new thing that the Holy Ghost told any Christian church in 2,000 years, which Jesus already didn't tell you in so many different words. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. It is he who has sent among the unlettered a messenger from themselves, and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they were before in clear error. In John 16, chapter 25th verse, Jesus says, I have told these things figuratively. And in 16, chapter 12th verse, Jesus says, I have much more to say, but the time to know and to bear them is in the last days. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet then. Wash my hands and head too. <laughs> Those who have taken a bath are completely clean and do not need to wash themselves, except for their feet. All of you are clean. All except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, all of you except one are clean. The Holy Spirit empowers people to remember. So remind, you are only a reminder. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now, wait a minute. Is that the response to the rejection of the gospel that we would have expected? Is that what we would expect? Is that how you respond when you're confronted with indifference? 
Do you immediately praise God? Do you say, I praise You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants? What is our Lord saying here? He's saying this, that I can praise the Father even when the gospel is rejected and compounds judgment because salvation is totally an act of God. This is the glorious confidence of the Son in the sovereignty of the Father. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And when our verses are recited to them as clear evidences, they say, This is not but a man who wishes to avert you from that which your fathers were worshipping. And they say, This is not except a lie invented. And those who disbelieve say of the truth when it has come to them, This is not but obvious magic. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And be patient and do not grieve over them and do not be in distress over what they conspire. Isaiah 65.10 But they were the ones who rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. So he, right, the Holy Spirit became an enemy to them, became an enemy to them. Non-persons can't become an enemy to you, right? And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from mankind and jinn, inspiring to one another decorative speech in delusion. But if your Lord had willed, they would not have done it. So leave them and that which they invent. The Holy Spirit, again, experiences grief. The Holy Spirit, again, is called a whom. The Holy Spirit um, seals people for the day of redemptions, indicating that he's part of redemption. And all these things, only persons, indicating that he's part of redemption, 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 indicating that he's part of redemption. You see, there's a common denominator between us, between us. And that is Jesus Christ. He said that if I don't go, he won't come. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. John chapter 16 verse 7. It is expedient, this is simple English. Mm -hmm. It is expedient for you, it's better for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. Romans 8.26 Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit intercedes and only persons can intercede on behalf of other persons, right? So what do we learn about this? We learn that the Holy Spirit comes. We learn that the Holy Spirit uh, guides people into all truth, right? So guiding all people, all truth. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit hears. The Holy Spirit declares. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit takes. The Holy Spirit is a he. The Holy Spirit is a him. The Holy Spirit is a helper. 
The Holy Spirit is sent. The Holy Spirit is from the Father. The Holy Spirit bears witness about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a whom, a who, and a he. Anybody getting bored yet? This is so much proof, right? He himself fought against them, right? The Holy Spirit fights. So the Holy Spirit um, experiences an emotion, grief. Gifts don't experience grief. Persons do. The Holy Spirit became an enemy to them, became an enemy to them. Only persons can become an enemy to other persons. The Holy Spirit fights against persons. Only persons can fight against other persons. The Holy Spirit is called he. The Holy Spirit is called himself. O prophet, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them. And their refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. It is a reckless kind of movement. It is a shameful and dangerous sin to heap such abuse on the Holy Spirit. In fact, the idea of bringing dishonor on the Holy Spirit ought to make any thinking person tremble. And among them are those who abuse the prophet and say, He is an ear. Say, It is an ear of goodness for you that believes in Allah. And those who abuse the messenger of Allah, for them is a painful punishment. So let me run down the long list of attributes that describe the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. So the Holy Spirit resists, enables, leads, fills, strengthens, instructs, speaks, searches, comes, goes, is a gift, is like fire, is like a dove, is called God's presence, baptizes, cleanses, sanctifies, justifies, hovers, creates, gives life, takes part in salvation, raises the dead, can be grieved, can be profaned, can be outraged, can be spurned, can become an enemy, fights, helps, empowers, intercedes, produces good fruits, comprehends, carries along, is called the spirit of wisdom and understanding, is called the spirit of counsel and might, is called the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit anoints, dwells, can can be stifled, can be resisted, is eternal, is of truth, hears, declares, glorifies, takes, convicts, bears witness, uh, gives hope, regenerates, renews, seals, guarantees inheritance, has fellowship. As a contrast to uh, what we see in Matthew chapter 12, for example, the leaders of Israel committed the unpardonable sin. And uh, uh, what was that unpardonable sin? It was attributing to Satan the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? It was attributing to Satan the work of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 12, 30, 31, 32. What's going on today is the opposite, attributing to the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. That's what's going on, attributing to the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. Satan is alive and at work in deception, false miracles, bad theology, lying visions, lying dreams, lying revelations, deceptive teachers who are in it for the money and power and influence. Satan is alive and well. And the work of Satan is being attributed to the Holy Spirit. That is a serious blasphemy, just as attributing to Satan the work of the Holy Spirit is a serious blasphemy. It's always important to keep in mind that there are two judgments. The particular judgment which every soul will experience at the hour of death, and then the universal judgment or the general judgment when all people will be judged at the end of time. So keep those, that distinction in mind. There are actually two judgments when we talk about end time or final judgment. 
At that time, Christ will come, quote, in his glory, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In this way, the disciples and Mary in John 20, 14th verse and in 21, 4th verse did not recognize Jesus after rising from death. Because Jesus appeared in different form in Mark 16, chapter 12th verse. Let them hear who has an ear. According to Revelation 1st chapter 13th verse and 14th chapter 14th verse, John in his vision saw Christ after his resurrection in another form resembling Son of Man. Daniel saw second coming very early in Daniel 7th chapter 13th verse. In Revelation 14th chapter 14th to 16th verses, a sharp sickle is present in the hands of one who is like son of man. This is the message of harvesting. That means it is the everlasting gospel. This message is especially to make the bride ready. This coming of one who is like son of man with a sharp sickle is resembling harvest and the work of harvest. Very few people will accept this message. In this harvest, bride is like separated fruit of crop, thinking that son of man and one like a son of man is same, is like deceiving yourself. If there is no difference, then you have to answer why did the Bible say the one like a son of man. We have to cast the teaching which obey the word, but not convenient or beneficial teaching. When you recognize it, you will recognize the second coming. There was certainly in their stories a lesson for those of understanding. Never was the Quran a narration invented, but a confirmation of what was before it and a detailed explanation of all things and guidance and mercy for a people who believe. Abu Huraira related that the Messenger of God, upon whom be peace, said, I am the one closest to Jesus, the son of Mary, in this world and the other one. The prophets are like brothers, sons of one father and various wives. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. There is no other prophet between us. Hadith from Bukhari and Muslim. To figure out what Jesus thought, I think he did think that he was a prophet. Um, I think ultimately, though, that he thought that he was the one, he was not only the one who was proclaiming God's truth to those who could hear, he, he was that, so he was a prophet in that sense. But I think Jesus also believed his apocalyptic message that God was soon to bring destruction and to set up a new kingdom on earth that would be a utopian kingdom for those who, who did what God, what God demanded of them. And Jesus thought he himself would be the king of this kingdom. So uh, Jesus, I think Jesus believed there was going to, that Israel was going to be made a sovereign state. Jerusalem would be the capital. He would be the king and his disciples would be his co-rulers. Um, and so he did think he was a prophet, but I think he thought that he was the future Messiah in that sense. But in Jesus' day, people would expect there, there might be a future king who uh, sets up, uh, you know, and so uh, that's what happened. He sets up, uh, he, he was expected to set up a kingdom. And I think he's the one who, who, conceived of that idea. So it's really not the Muslim view, but it's also, you know, it's not the Christian view either. In the early Gospels, it's designed to show that he has God's authority, that he is able to, that God has authorized him to, to fulfill God's will on earth. And so he's got God's authority.